Jesus. Wow. Let me tell you how good my dad is. My father. First week I was here in September, I had a case that I had to, uh, it was not a good case. It didn't look good. Um, in J July, I received, um, let's go back. Um, I've been helping out a family for a few years now that are, that have a child that's very involved. And um, this is a testimony. It's testimony. Very involved. And so I've been helping her, them out. And because the parents are migrants and just don't have the paperwork yet, even though they are in a court hearing right now, and it's just pending, and it's just basically on hold, and I think it's until the president comes, and the new president, but um, basically um, they have pending a cancellation of removal. And meanwhile, the child is getting all these services, and the only way to get services was to get her into the uh, system, basically. And so I took on this case to help, uh, to help out. And I received a letter just this July that said I owed quite a bit of money that I was responsible for paying. And so I carried that burden. I, I, I carried that for, I said, how did this happen? How, just, how does this happen? And, you know, we've been working, I've been working closely with the family. I've been going to their house pretty regularly and just, uh, they consider me their pastor. It's just amazing how they are. I, I just love them. You find a family like that and you just do that. And um, you receive a letter like that and you say, God, I know this family is not at fault what happened. I am, you know, I, I'm the rep payee, what's considered the rep payee. And I started to say something went wrong. And so I went paper by paper, line by line, number by l number. And it's not an easy thing for someone who, uh, who has dyslexia all of a sudden just, or who had dyslexia all of a sudden looking at that and all of a sudden your eyes just go crazy. Say, oh my goodness. And so I brought it up to the Lord, and I said, God, help me with this, because I have no way of, first of all, telling the parents who just had a baby that day, and um, I had no way of uh, bringing this up to them without giving them an explanation. And then, um, so I, one thing led to another, and I'm looking at this, and I said, I did not read the fine print. I did not read the fine print. And so I said, I am at fault here. What do I do? And so I had a box, and I brought it to God. Now, hold and be like, I, I mean, I had a verse that the Lord kept stirring in my heart that I shared with you the first day that we came back in September, and that was uh, Colossians 2, 13 and 14 from the New King James Version. And it says, he, he wiped away wiped out and, and it just kept stirring but I didn't put the two together he wiped out the requirement that was against you that was contrary to you and I know that some of you remember that because I shared that and um and I said this wipe out and I connected it to my mom cleaning her household and so I said I don't know what I'm going to do that day I came in that day but did not want to be here at first and I'll tell you why I let me go back. I wanted to be here, but I knew I was not prepared for that case the next morning. So I texted Amy and Aaron. I texted Pastor Amy and Aaron, and I said, I wanted to be there so badly, but I can't because I'm not finished with this case, and I need you to pray for this case. And not giving them any details. I said, this is my last chance. I already got a letter, and they said that I don't stand ground and that I got to pay it, and so I'm going, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go the next day, and I'm going to go. And, so I, and I said, I'm going to put everything together. And so I put everything together knowing I was at fault. And then all of a sudden, I just closed the box because by then it was a box. I closed the box and I said, no, I'm going to 3D. And I came and like 
it was within 30 minutes because I just closed it. I said, I'm coming. And I came to 3D and I just let everything go. Let everything go that I was holding on since July all the way to September. I just let it go. And then I said, God, it's in your hands. And I remember, I remember sharing this verse with you. He wiped out the handwriting of requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it, taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. I started laughing that night, and I don't know if anybody saw me, but there was just something that happened when I was standing there. I just started laughing. I said, God, do I dare ask you to wipe this away? Do I dare ask? And then I drive home, and I said, wait a minute. I remember my sister having a problem like this when she rented rooms in the Gaylord Hotel in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and, and I said, I dare ask you to wipe this away. I am a child of God. I am your daughter. I am your daughter. You have all the resources. There's a verse in the Bible that says, he stretched out the heavens and literally spread the earth all by himself, all on his own. He did it. He did it all. I mean, and what gets to me is himself and his own. And he, he stretched, and all I kept thinking is, I dare ask you. I know I'm at fault. I know that the requirements stand against me. I know that. But I'm asking you to erase this debt that I owe because of my fault. I don't know how to tell these parents, but it was my fault. And um, I go in there that next morning with the family and my husband, who was just, he was just so great supporting me and praying also and just, he was just great about it and said, we're just going to, you know, at first he wanted to get politicians. I said, no, 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 this was my fault. And so I go in there. And he was just praying behind, praying behind me. And then they said, why do you feel you're not at fault here? And when they said that, I just went white. And I said, I am at fault. I am at fault. But I'm asking you to wipe out this debt. Because this family can't afford it. And we don't know what the future holds right now. And simply because I'm asking you. I'm just asking you. Now, to ask a government to wipe out 6000 almost $7,000 is a lot. But it's not a lot for God. So then I didn't hear anything from them for a while. I went home, and Jim said, I just want to make sure we're asking you. We're asking you to clear this debt even though everything was against us. I'm telling you, everything was against us. So we're asking you. I get a letter Friday while I'm sitting with them. Um, I get a text. I'm sitting with David and Nicole Binion and Delia. And um, I'm Bishop, and we're, we're eating, and we're ready to go to Beyond the Veil. We're ready to go, and all of a sudden I get this text. I need to talk to you right away, like ASP. And I said, I can't. I'm pinched in and, you know, very uncomfortable. Can you all move so I can go call my husband? No. <laughs> you know that feeling. <laughs> and so then um, he just takes a picture of the letter and sends it to me and says, you will not have to pay the debt that was against you. But God, but God, but God, but God. But God, he they raised it. I mean, but God, but God. And so it was amazing to be able to tell this family because this family, we all left at peace, even though we just knew everything was good. We all left at peace and said, it's done. It's in God's hands. And I literally told the family, it's done. It's in God's hands. You know, I, I can't tell you. I, I, I can't tell you the feeling it was. And the feeling continues to be. But here's... Here's why I share that. He holds all the resource. He is the source. He is the source. And when you put 
the kingdom of God first. All these things will be added, not subtracted. They'll be added unto you. Added. The other thing is that you just got to know who you are. You're his daughter. You just got to know who you are. It doesn't care whether you're right or wrong. You're his daughter. And he favors you. He favors us. He favors, I believe, that when I walked in there, they saw beyond you. You know that they did not even look at one piece of paper that I had in that box. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. I loved how Bishop said it. They say, he said, he transcended all of that. He transcended all of that. Transcended all of that. And so one of the things that uh, we talked about was there is something that happens when you give God your first fruit and when you just give him your all. And I've never taken it as, a, as, a, as something um, as law. You know, to me, it's just a principle since I was young. I've learned to tithe and I've learned to, um, to give to God without question. I just give him. I just give it to him. And, you know, if there's anything that I've learned, I've learned that I go from gross pay and not net pay. Um, I learned it even more when Social Security tells me, oh, no, we count the gross pay, not the net pay. So even more, it proved my point and say, God, if everybody else takes from the gross pay, why can't you? That's just a principle. It's a kingdom principle. But what's even greater about the principle is that you live on the blessing and not what's before you. I cannot tell you. I cannot tell you how many times my checkbook just doesn't add up. Doesn't add up. But I'm never in need. Never in need. Never in need. Money is currency. And he, he circulates it. He circulates it so that his favored ones get it. That's right. He's the banker. And all we have to do is stretch out our hands, whether that is to give to him or receive. When you give to him, he gives you more and more and more. You want to hear another part of that story? They had me opened up another account because they had to put another amount of money that was larger than what I owed for that family. But God, Amen. but God, Amen. but God. So when I looked at the count today, I said, what is this? <laughs> what is this? And they're like, no. And here I was just ecstatic to tell his family who lives in a one-bedroom apartment, five people, five kids in a one-bedroom. You have no idea what lives around you. You have no idea sometimes. No, no idea. In a, a one-bedroom apartment, they would all be, and I said, you're going to be able to move to a new house so that your kids can have their bedroom. And so that's just God, but God. And she says, how merciful is God? And so they're seeing God in a whole new level, whole new level, watching that. But I'm going to ask with that story, and that's a true story. I'm not going to, I can't even fabricate it even if I wanted to. I'm going to ask that whatever you have, that you put it in your seed and you give it to the Lord, whatever you have, whether that be a burden. Because it was crazy. It, it, it's crazy. I, I just don't give. I, 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 you know, I normally don't do this. And, I, you know, I, I don't like to um, share. I just don't give my tithe. I, I vowed um, a long time ago that I'm trying to live off of 10% instead of 90%. I, that's my goal in life. It's a long goal, but it's my goal, and I believe I can get there. And so I don't just give to my place of sowing. I give to sowing in other places, too. I give to the people that have ministered to me in my life. Um, you eat here. You eat here. So that's where you sow. That's, that's really what it is. You eat, 
And so you've got to bring your plate to, to the table. It's just simple as that. And we know this. I, you know, I'm talking to the choir. We know this. I'm singing to the choir. But um, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to do that. I do it cheerfully. There is joy when I do it. I do it here and I do it. I, I, you know, my, my, my situation is a little unique. I happen to just give here and to Living Word. And, you know, because to me, I consider that my second church. You know, I, I just do, you know. But then there's something that happens when you give above that, above that, above. Now, I'm not rich, but I'm wealthy. I'm wealthy. I'm very wealthy. And so if anybody asks, how do you do it? How do you go on all these trips? How do you do all this? I'm wealthy. I'm wealthy. And I'm going again. <laughs> Don't know how, but I'm going again. Because <laughs> I'm wealthy. Because the Father gives. And so I leave you what I've received. I leave you what I've received. I ask you to live on your blessing and not what's right in front of you, but to live on the blessing. There's some quotes in the book that I wrote down. It says, the revelation of our true identity will destroy the spirit of poverty in our lives. One quote. quote. Most of us are still looking at our provision to help us determine our vision and therefore are living within our means instead of his blessing, his blessings. We are sons and daughters of the owner. We just don't work for the farm. Our daddy has plenty. Fear, uh, fear of lack is completely foreign to the minds of sons and daughters of God. Fear of lack are foreign. So if you're fearing that you're going to lack when you give, you have an identity crisis. There's an identity crisis. Okay? And so fear of lack is foreign to the children of God, and we're his children. I just had to share that with you today because God is so good. He's good. He, good. he is so good. He gives and he gives and he gives and he gives. He gives. And here's this crazy thing about it. I didn't have to pay that debt. But you know what? I celebrate. And, and I got more money to give them, but I celebrate that I was able to give it to them. I celebrate that. I celebrate. I was like, well, it didn't go in your pocket. It, it doesn't have to. Because when they win, I win. When you're blessed, I bless. What does Bishop said? Don't be jealous. <laughs> Bless them because you get double of it. You get theirs and yours. So let's pray while we bring our offering to the Lord. Bring our offering to the Lord. Why do I ask you to bring? Because it says bring your offerings to him. There's something that happens when you take your offering. And you literally bring it to the Lord. You walk on the promise that you bring that seed with. You have to literally take it and put it in the ground so that it can grow. And so that's why I ask that you bring it up, that you bring it and you sow it. Um, I, you know, yeah, we could pass the baskets around, and sometimes we do. But I just love watching people sow because... I watch them grow also. And I celebrate with you. Amen? Let's, pr let's pray um, for his, his wonderful blessings. Father God, I, I just thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you give us so much. You give and you give and you give. Lord, and in so many ways, you just continue to add to us, Lord, as we bring your seed, Lord. You know the need, you know the, 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 what's in that seed, the thoughts that are in the seeds, Lord, the, the weight that that seed comes with, Lord. You know what it comes with, Lord, and you will provide all our needs because you are our provider.
heart. So I thank you for that, and I take this opportunity, Lord Father God, to open up this place that we may cheerfully bring to you and put our seed, bring to you our offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Good evening, ladies. How you doing tonight? Good, really? <laughs> I am uh, getting ready to go out of town again. I'm leave, leaving tomorrow morning, and I'm gone for almost a week. I'll be back next Tuesday night. So, yeah, I haven't. Uh, it's just the travel season for me, so I'm a little bit like, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> but um, preaching a worship conference in New Jersey that I actually do every year. They guess they don't get sick of me so uh, every week every year and <laughs> I'm doing uh I do all their main preaching sessions and then this year they had me doing a keyboard clinic out of nowhere I was like oh <laughs> I hate doing keyboard clinics but uh but, you know you do what you're asked so um yeah so we leave in the morning and then uh we actually get I actually took two extra days coming back we're going taking my kids to sight and sound have you ever been to Sight and Sound Theater in Lancaster? Um, Samson's playing right now. I Honestly, Sight and Sound, I've been to all sorts of Broadway shows because I'm a theater buff. I love it. Sight and Sound's better. I don't even know what to tell you. They're, you know, they run 12, 15 performances a week, sell out year-round. Broadway does five, you know what I mean? Like, it's not, it's no joke, it's amazing. So Samson's playing there now, so we're going New Jersey down to Lancaster, coming back, so I should be back for next Tuesday night, that's the plan anyway, so. Um, but uh, last week, last week, dear Lord, the week before, I feel like Bishop, Bishop Stearns, he's always like, where was I, what was I doing? Um, but I was down in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, and I think I shared last week a little bit about this great church in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, right outside Pittsburgh, and uh, had an amazing time, but on the way back, I went to the outlet mall, and the Grove City one, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Grove City, all amazing, <laughs> amazing ridiculousness, if you're, I don't even, I'm, I'm actually not a shopper at all, I'm one of those that's like, shoot, I need something, and I go to the store reluctantly, go get what I want, and I'm out of there, I don't like to shop, um, I'm liking boots and shoes, but uh, other than that, I don't like to shop, so I am not one of those people, but there, I went there, because we went to a few of the, the outlets that I loved, and, um, but when I was there, I, uh, I got some gifts from my leaders here that I wanted to give to some special people that make 3D work, well, there, when I'm, you, know, you have to understand, I have a, this, as, as the associate, the senior associate here, I am like, I'm a nutcase, I, I'm one minute, I am, I'm, you know, Bishop, Stearns has me all over the place as his kind of right arm on this side, and Pastor Jim's the left arm over here, so the two of us are like, wow, you know, and then I got my father, too, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> and then there's, you know, me in the middle, so there's just, like, loopiness going on all the time, and I couldn't do women's ministry without some people around me, because there is just amazing, incredible women that come into this place that are just so broken and need just people to surround them. And I can't do that all by myself. If we want to see all of us rise to the place that we're called to, God just takes a bunch of brokenness and puts it back together. And I, I think it was, was it in this book I was reading the other day? I'm reading like four right now. I, this one, I think it was in this one where they said God takes, a, like, we're like crystal vases that have broken apart, but when God puts us back together, it looks like etched glass. You know, it doesn't look like a broken 
vessel that's just all glued together looks like it's going to fall apart, missing holes. It, we look like beautiful etched crystal, you know? And, you know, and, and it takes time in the presence of God. It takes the atmosphere being prepared. It takes emails and phone calls and meeting with people and getting involved in people's lives. And I can't do all that. You know, I, it's just not possible. I, I do what I can and, and I don't, I'm not even actually gifted in a lot of those areas, to be honest with you. Counseling, please don't ask me for that. I, I don't know, because I'll give you like two minutes of advice, and then I'm like, just do it. You know, I can't, it, there's not the patience and the, you know, and, but then there's people that'll just go with people for the long haul, you know. I'm like, get over yourself. You know, it just, I'm not, I get, I get crazy, and I'm that hard on myself, too. Like, stop your crying. You know, I get like that after a while. So um, it takes amazing people to stand with me and to work with me and to be me in several locations. And there's a few of those in this room. So when I was gone, I got some beautiful autumn candy candles from Yankee Candle, which is my favorite, to be honest. So um, we've got some sort of autumn spice one, and we've got pumpkin spice. And this, I don't know who, you can exchange your candles if you want, <laughs> but if you want a different one. But this is for my Enid, my sweet other cuff covenant sister. <laughs> Everybody, Deli and I have been, Enid's twin Deli and I have been covenant sisters forever. Like, and I knew Deli long before I knew Enid, and it was kind of a long journey. But over the last seven or eight years or more, it's been more Enid in my life <laughs> than Deli is able to be. And I'm like, I am just as much in covenant with you, Chicky Poo, as I am with your sister. <laughs> And, uh, and then there's my Aaron, who is my life partner, <laughs> my worship partner, because she, you know, in life, there are people that you just know, you don't even have to tell them you need prayer, and they shoot you a text message that they're praying about this and this and this, and you're like, how do you know these things? That's Aaron. So, um, in my life, and, um. Let's see, I don't know what colors to give. So you can, you can exchange these later. But this is for the lady behind the camera. <laughs> yes, who is an amazing teacher and covered the whole summer by accident. She's like, well, nobody else can do this. I'll do this. I'll do this. And so she was our 3D instructor for the summer. <laughs> This other girl, now there's several missing tonight, so I'll just hold on to the rest of these, but this other one has no idea she's getting one, but I believe has an administrative gift that I have never yet even hardly begun to tap into because she's so incredible and so gifted and never wants anybody to know she's here, okay? But I think she's an amazingly talented and future leader in the body of Christ, and that's Kristen Elliott. <laughs> we love you. And there's several others that are not here that are active and part of there. Oh, wait a minute. I had one more. <laughs> I just thought of this. Not thought of this, but just remembered. There's somebody here tonight that doesn't, isn't one of our leaders here for 3D necessarily. But Yolanda runs our, our singles ministry and is never honored as a leader among us. And when there is a woman that I know is transitioning into being a single parent that has just gone through Yolanda's not only got prayer warrior skills <laughs> to tear down every stronghold, <laughs> but she's got the most practical, amazing advice on how to be a brilliant parent and provide in those situations. So I wanted to honor you as well tonight. You are amazing. Mm. And there's Kara, and if, I'm going to send one to Amy Pazinski, too. If you're watching, Amy, you're going to get one of these candles. But there is a amazing people that surround you all the time that in order for us, that's why God says that we're all part of a body, because, you know, I might get a lot of credit <laughs> sometimes. This, this place up here, especially the one when you're in the pulpit in there, it's, you get you get thrown as many tomatoes as you do kisses, you know? So you're not, you know, it's not all warm and fuzzy. It's actually mostly the other side of things. And uh, so, but I realize that we're all parts of body, the body that are so intricate 
to making things happen. I remember I got a couple emails this year from some girls that are new to the church, and I just immediately start sending them, forwarding them to people, once I get the people's permission, to people that I know that can help and step in the situation. Um, because I can't do it all, and I shouldn't do it all, because it's also helping you to release your destiny as well. So I believe that there's a lot of women sitting here that aren't credited as leaders, that are rising and becoming pillars in this hour, because you're gonna know who you are. And that's what Supernatural Rays of Royalty is all about, knowing who you are, truly understanding that you are the head and not the tail, right. that you wear a crown that you're not exposed, you wear a crown, and you walk as a daughter of the Most High God. And regardless of the hand life has dealt you or the circumstances that you're facing right now, God has, when it, when it says that he works all things together, for we, you know, we take those scriptures and like, you know, he works all things together for the, I know, I know, you know. But I'm telling you, when you, when you look back, because in the middle of the process, you just want to slap somebody when they say that to you. But in the middle of the process, it's hard. But when you look back, when you do it God's way, when you find him in the middle of the trauma, when you find him, you realize that you wouldn't even go back and change it. You would, if you had the power to go back and erase it from your life, you wouldn't even do it. Because you found him in the midst of it, and you found a piece of who you are in the midst of it. There was a quote that I never got to on Sunday morning. I only did uh, a couple little bits and pieces on Sunday morning. Of course, I had seven pages of notes that were all like thick, so I don't, don't get to most of it on Sunday morning. But there was a quote at the end, and I, I don't know if it's the, I think it's the end of the book, Finding Favor with the King, um, that I want to begin by reading. And then it kind of launches us into a few bullet points that I want to bring out about this week's chapter in the book. So you can just listen for a second. Tommy Tenney writes so beautiful. You can just listen for a second but, second. but it talks about our posture. And it talks about the opportunity that awaits us by finding the King of the Kings and the Lord of Lords. From the first blushing glance of a young girl toward her beloved to the passionate pursuit of a bride and groom, love is indivisible from life. The greatest lesson we may learn from Esther is simply fall in love with the king. Discover the wonder of the king's presence. You've been chosen for such a time as this. You too are destined for the palace, the place of his presence. Prepare for your moment in his presence. Prepare for your moment of divine favor. Learn the protocol of his presence. Learn how to shed your peasant ways and carry yourself like a prison, princess. Wear his favorite color, blood-bought worship. Decide you will no longer shout your demands from the gates. You can whisper your wishes from the intimate embrace of worship instead of announcing your requests in formal petition from the outer courts. When the church, the bride of the king, whispers her heart's desire, her king's heart is moved, and kingdoms begin to shift like pawns on a chessboard. Why worry or fret over your fate? Prepare for your moment of favor. Intimacy with the king holds the key to your future. Esther had a blind date with her destiny, and so can you. Never underestimate the potential of one worship encounter. It only takes one night with the king to turn a peasant into a princess. One moment of favor can change everything. 30 seconds in his present can change your destiny. One night with the king changes everything. There is a posture of worship that is directly connected to knowing your identity. I don't know what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Is it posturing yourself in worship where you discover your identity, or is it discovering your identity, opening up a new posture of worship? The answer probably is <laughs> yes, it's both. It's not a 
one, two, three, four, five succession or sequence. It is coming in to his presence, sometimes feeling totally lost and abandoned, fixing your eyes single-mindedly on the King of kings and Lord of lords. Remember I said on Sunday, learn to worship with the enemy at your table. Even if that situation, that enemy, that person, that thing is staring at you right in the face, you look past it. You know, in relationships we have when you can, you can meet somebody in a crowded room and you're talking and you're not really even talking to them because you're looking over their shoulder. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that drives me crazy when people do that. I'm like, you don't, you don't have to talk to me, but if you're going to, at least talk to me, you know? <laughs> and it's like, I'm not insecure. You don't have to talk to me, but please don't look past me when you're talking to me. I, but think about that, the positive side of that, when your enemy's at the table. Look right past him and in the eyes of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right past that situation, right past that burden, right past that news, right past that darkness that you're facing in life, and right into the eyes of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Learn to worship with the enemy at your table. Because it's in that exchange where that, because you can't fix your eyes on him without discovering that his eyes are fixed on you. So it's in that exchange, in that moment of that fixed gaze that you find a portion of your identity, a new dimension of your identity, a new unveiling of your identity. See, everything that you are as a royal daughter of the Most High God is implanted inside of you. It's already there. But the discovery of that is a lifetime. And you're not going to discover it by experimentation. You discover it through those moments where the enemy is rearing his ugly, filthy head and you find Jesus instead. It's in those moments that you find more and more and more of who you are. So I want to talk a little bit, pick up a little bit from where we left off last week. For those of you who don't know, we've been kind of going through this book, The Supernatural Ways of Royalty. Unfortunately, I don't have any new copies in this week. They will be here for next week. Um, last, uh, last week we left off with a confession of faith that I wrote down that's in the book that, well, the tips are in the book or the principles are in the book and I turned it into a confession of faith that you begin your days, you begin your moments or you walk into those tough times where you're faced with a decision or when your flesh is pulling you one way but you know that's not the way you're supposed to go. You know, all those moments that we all face, that you have a statement that you memorize, and this is a great one, <laughs> of who you are that you speak into the atmosphere. And this is what I wrote. I am royal. Number one, I'm royal. I have forgiven. Maybe let's add, I am forgiven and have forgiven. Because we're going to talk tonight about the am forgiven. Last week we talked about the have forgiven. Am forgiven is your identity as a child of the Most High God, that you are forgiven. It's past tense, present tense, and future tense. You are forgiven. So I am forgiven and I have forgiven myself and those around who have hurt me and abused. I've rejected lies. I have rejected lies. When you reject lies, you are defeating the enemy at his game. Because the only thing that the enemy can do is lie and create an illusion. It's the only thing he can do. He has no power. He's been defeated. He has no truth inside of him. He can only deceive. So it's lies and illusion. People give the enemy so much credit. They think we got to quote 72 degrees of theology at him to bind him. He doesn't understand any of that. He's an idiot. He works in lies and illusion. You expose that, he's done. Give him no credit. We don't need 82 steps to spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare has three words. It is finished. And while we got to bind him up, we bind him with that, not with our little dances and our Indian rituals. You know what I'm saying? We don't need any of that. 
So I am royal. I am and have forgiven. I have rejected lies, and I embrace truth. It's all you need. <laughs> I am royal. I am and have forgiven. I reject lies and embrace truth. Because in those moments, because we're all, we all face them, you might be living in a, in a clean place right now or an easy place right now, but something rears its head. We go through ebbs and flows in our life. We go through high places and valleys. We go through victories. We go through defeats. But we come back through the confession of our identity in a place of worship. And every time you go into his chamber, every time you come in as his daughter and come before him, you find a new piece of who you are. Last week we talked about the privilege and right of royalty to forgive. Today I want to emphasize was actually the subtitle of this chapter. Forgiveness rewrites our history. So last week was a hard week, and it was very quiet in here last week because <laughs> nobody likes to talk about the topic of forgiveness when it comes to forgiving others because we have a lot of reasons why we shouldn't have to forgive. And if you're looking at it from a purely human perspective, there's probably a lot of reasons why you shouldn't have to forgive that particular person in your life because of what they did and how horrible they hurt you or betrayed you or whatever the circumstance was. So there's a lot of human reasons not to forgive. The problem is our determination last week was when you don't forgive, you are binding yourself to the very same spirit that controls them. So we have to forgive in order to break that tie and to be who we are called to be. But we also came to the determination that it is not by our might, but it is by his spirit that we forgive. We forgive out of his forgiveness, his forgiveness flowing through us to others. So that's kind of where we left things last week. But today we're going to talk about forgiveness, rewriting our history. You know, there's so much that is tied between forgiving others and being forgiven and forgiving ourselves. Those things are so interwoven that you can't really separate one from the other, even though we did one last week and we're going to talk about this this week. <laughs> that's about as far as it can go because it's intricately woven together. If you can't forgive yourself for things that you have done or felt or said or whatever, or maybe forgive yourself for things you haven't done, that can be just as thick. If you can't forgive yourself, how do you walk in your identity and receive his forgiveness? How do you forgive others? You see what I'm saying? It's all so intricately woven together. Sin's power to destroy us is itself destroyed by a superior reality, forgiveness. These are some quotes from the book. See, viewing your past or somebody else's sin apart from the blood of Jesus brings about a spirit of deception in your life. If you look on your past without seeing it through the blood of Jesus, you are playing into the enemy's game of deception. And you, in essence, receive or be, you become overtaken in a way by the spirit of deception. So you are always being pulled back into behaviors or attitudes or sometimes just complete defeat. You know, I, because you have these cycles. It, it doesn't have to be brutal moral sin. It could be things that you didn't do or, you know, something happens in your life and you're like, what could I have done to prevent that? Or what could I have done to protect them from? You know, I mean, all these things. And you have to let yourself off the hook, forgive yourself, or you're going to get sucked into that pit of all of that deception that the enemy is trying to stir up with the situation. So forgiving yourself is as critical as receiving his forgiveness and forgiving others. 
always see your past, your mistakes, and even, let's add, other people's sin through the lens of the blood of Jesus. Because whether they or you have received his forgiveness, his blood was still shed on their behalf, on your behalf. So you get to a point where no matter how horrific a person is, you know, just watch the news. The, the people, the, the radical Muslims that are killing Christians and beheading Christians that the liberal media won't cover, but it's all over the place if you look for it. How do you even, they're, they're the lowest form of humanity, right? I mean, we could go through and like, they're lower than the, the creatures that crawl. You know what I mean? We could go through on the, and talk about people like that because in human terms, absolutely. People that molest children, the lowest form of human behavior. There could, that's, ah, yeah, that makes a mother's heart go, rah, you know? It's just, it's too much. But they're still a soul that Jesus shed his blood for. So how do we walk in hatred, even though all human circumstances should point to detesting and hating those people with everything that you are? We as Christians cannot walk in that dimension, not as royalty can we walk in that dimension, even though they stink and deserve it. I can't believe I said that twice in my sermon on Sunday morning, and now I'm saying it again, but certain things just, you know, even though people deserve it, even when people deserve it and absolutely we can make a list of things that people deserve it we get it right but Jesus still shed his blood as much for them as he did for us so part of growing into the rights and privileges of being a son or daughter, a royal son and daughter of the Most High God, is beginning to see everything through the lens of the blood of Jesus. Everything. The atoning blood of Jesus covers sin, never to be uncovered again. You know, women, one of our worst tendencies as women, whether it's in marriages or anything, part of the way we control situations is nagging. And I know you, you, there's no naggers in this room, right? None. But there are times, little stupid things. I got a new desk in for our homeschool room. I got two new desks in. They were on sale. I grabbed them. And they were on sale. They came in, and they're in pieces. And I can't put the darn tootin' things together, or they'll be upside down and backwards, right? And so I asked Jay to do it. Asked him again to do it. Asked him again to do it. And as soon as I shut up, I came home last night after our Christmas rehearsal, and guess what was together? The desks are together. Takes him 10 minutes. It would have been four years me trying to put those drawers and the sliders in there. I'm not good at that stuff. But, you know, one of our worst tendencies as women is to try and control by nagging, right? So the thing about the blood of Jesus is that you can't uncover what he's already covered. And so as women, one of the things we want to keep doing, you know, especially in marriages, man, and I'm sure it happens in lots of other spheres, but did you ever get to a time where you're and your husband are in a disagreement and you bring up something that happened four years ago, ten years ago, to prove your point? You know what I mean? And it happens all the time. And that may happen to parent, to, to you and your parents, to you and your sister or brother. When you keep bringing up something from the past to support your cause for the present, then you are uncovering something. And so think about that in light of our sin. Jesus covered sin with his very blood. And when we uncover and expose it again, what are we doing to the Savior who shed the blood? We're not nullifying its effectiveness, but we're in essence saying, 
I don't even have words for it, but you know what I'm saying. You're just kind of like lessening in your eyes. You're taking for granted the very thing you did. When we come to this understanding, we begin to grow up in our faith, as Paul put it. Grow up in our faith. Because we start seeing people through the lens of the blood and stop trying to uncover what Jesus has already covered. And the thing about it is that they may not even have received that yet. But we have to honor them as if they did so that we can open the door for them to come in. I don't know if that made any sense to you. But um, it was funny this week, um, we were talking about, we have some new media interns coming in, and, and we're like, blah, we don't know what we're doing, and <laughs> I'm over this whole thing now, so I'm freaking out. And one of them is not saved at all, just needs hours to log in college, you know, just one of those situations. His father-in-law comes here to church, that's it, you know. Reeks of cigarettes, like, to the point where you know he just chain smokes, and he's, it's just, it's you know, it's one of those things where you just have to go, okay. And um, his, do- his wife and new baby are starting to come here, but he's like, he wants them here, but he doesn't want anything to do with that part. He just wants ours. Okay, one of those situations. And so um, I was talking to um, the one who's running the program, and we were talking about how do we, do we or don't we take people like that, you know? <laughs> Because we fill out the volunteer applications here at the church, and you have to put your testimony in there. And he's like, I don't know what to write in there. I don't have anything to write. And she goes, well, tell me what I can pray for for you. And he said, you can pray for my wife and my daughter, but not me. Like, don't. And, he sa- and she's like, well, why? What is it? I, and he's like, I don't know that I believe what you believe, and I don't want to play a game. And <laughs> we're like, well, that's a start. <laughs> we can start there. But do you bring up all the junk? Do you bring up the smells? Do you bring up the stuff? Do you bring up the, you know what I mean? Do we uncover and expose what Jesus is trying to cover with his blood? Or do you take people as they are and see what God does? Do you know what I mean? And that's the fine line we walk in churches because most churches are like, clean them up first. Clean them up, clean them up, clean them up, put a suit on them, you know? (laughs) And Jesus just shed his blood for these people. And I'm believing one day this little guy is going to have a suit on when he comes to church and not smell. (laughs) Two things before we go. I don't know what time it is. Kim, do we have? Oh, it's, it's after time. Number two, Jesus is our defender and the devil is the accuser. So we talked about the blood and the lens of the blood, but here's the factual piece of information that we have to understand. Jesus is our defender. The devil is the accuser. So you, in your life, have a daily choice when these thoughts flood your mind to agree with one or the other. Okay? This is, so we're going to talk just for a couple minutes and we're going to be done, about the power of agreement. We make an agreement with the accuser when we view our past apart from the blood of Jesus, okay? So we look back and we see the stuff we've done wrong. We see the stuff that is just ugly that we don't want people to know about. We see stuff and maybe little addictions and things that keep coming back up or little things like that. Jesus purchased all of that. But when we go back and grab little pieces of it to remind ourselves or guilt or whatever from the past, we are in essence pulling away the blood of Jesus and agreeing with the accuser of the brothers. So we have to watch how much of these things, because you're going to come in agreement with one or the other. There's no neutral place. And just as a side note, there's really nothing neutral in the kingdom of God. Everything's hot. You know, in Revelation, you're either hot or you're cold. If you're lukewarm, you're out of my mouth. You know, there's really nothing neutral in the kingdom of God. And we have to understand that when we look at culture, when we look at people, when we look at things, there's the fine line between walking in the truth of God and then embracing and 
covering people. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, we're talking about all this grace stuff tonight and forgiveness, but there's still truth of God that we have to walk in, okay? There's really no neutral in the kingdom of God. We're going to talk about that as we learn the rays of royalty and the protocols that we're going to talk about. But realize that every day you have a choice to agree with one or the other. The enemy is always there with his little accusations, with his stuff. And if you give place to those things, the I will never change, I guess this is just who I am, I guess I'm just stuck, I guess this situation is just not going to change, how many things do I have to face? You know, when we do all of this stuff, we're in essence coming into agreement with the enemy, which is giving him permission to bring about more illusions, more lies, more deception, because that's the only place he can function in. And he can only do so much. If you come in agreement with Jesus, who is your defender. Because when you come in agreement into agreement with Jesus, your defender, then he does the fighting for you. So this is the key for me in walking out the ways of royalty is that we have to always have the royal mindset when we approach every little thing in our lives. And the royal mindset is not a superiority complex. The royal mindset is, I am walking in unity with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and I am demonstrating it in every area of our life. Now, it takes a lifetime to get there, but this is what we walk in. With whatever we agree with, we empower. So you either empower the enemy and more and more of his lies, deception, and illusion, or you empower Jesus to move on your behalf as your defender. And the other part of this, you can't come into agreement with the devil or the enemy at any cost. You can't come into agreement with him without totally losing yourself. You know that whole um, little Hollywood storyline of selling your soul to the devil? There's a lot of crazy truth in that. It's not literal, you know, like they have. They portray it in all of those crazy movies. But there is, the truth in it is that when you come into agreement with him, what is agreement? It's a contract. It's a compact. It's a covenant. So when you allow these little agreements to happen, they become big agreements. They be, over time, they become big. And before you know it, you're lost in that realm of illusion. In fact, you're probably lost back into your past. You know how we talk about de demons and dealing with demons? I don't know why this has become a thing for me. I'm like, I don't really like deliverance, and it happens over. And Sunday, it was all deliverance prayer. I was like, gosh, darn it all. But it, it's one of these things where they say when you cast it out, if you allow it back, it can come seven times worse, right? And that's biblical. So coming into an agreement is opening up not just a little crevice for the enemy to work, but a huge playing field for the deceiver of all deceivers. So we live in this place, in this tension of coming into agreement with one or the other. But when we agree with God, the crazy thing is we're enforcing our covenant with God. We're enforcing his victory. We're giving him free reign to move and to maneuver the situations and to bring them into alignment for his glory and kingdom purpose. But what does he do? We're, we are empowering him, but what does God do? He empowers us. The enemy enslaves us. God empowers us. So this chapter starts going into how God empowers us. He frees us from lies and causes us to truly live. The empowerment is not independent of God. It's because of God. So we're not given power to move independently of God and become prideful and become all this stuff. We move in power because of God and him moving through us in this free flow. See, what agreement does is it, think of life flow of the kingdom of God. I always think in terms of a conduit. Heaven flows to earth. You know, and it's like worship creates like a pipeline, you know, like an oil pipeline from heaven to earth. Covenant opens that thing up. When you keep coming into agreement, you're coming into deeper levels of covenant with God. 
So every time, every, I mean, I'm telling you, it's this simple. Every time you feel some sort of crazy lie coming at you from the enemy, when you make a choice to say no and you agree with God, your covenant grows stronger with him. Not him towards you. He's always there. But yours towards him, which opens up a wider conduit for heaven to come to earth and more power for you to walk in, to walk in authority and dominion. He also said this in the book, agreement with God equals stepping into the realm of truth. So as soon as you come into agreement with God, fix your gaze on him, you are in essence taking a step into the realm of truth so that you can begin to walk in wisdom in those situations. You're not walking ignorant in the midst of situation. You're walking with wisdom. You're walking in dominion. You're walking in authority. People look like look at you like, how'd you know that? You know, you're walking prophetically. You sound super smart. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, how did I do that? I keep that. <laughs> That's my girl. <laughs> That's my girl back there. She's like, what in the world? <laughs> She's like, how did I know that? It's because the word's inside of you. Agreement with God is the focus and activity of faith, enabling us to reap the fruit of truth. So think of it that way. The focus and activity of faith. People say, I need more faith. I need more faith. I need more faith. The focus and activity of that, how to sharpen that, is to every day, every moment, those little, remember that uh, Paul calls them those fiery darts, as they come in, you look at that as an opportunity to come into agreement with one realm or the other. Every dart is an opportunity. And man, so if you're getting hit with a lot of darts, that's a lot of great opportunity you have opening up door. That's a lot of great doors that are open. And what you do is you shift your focus, fix your gaze, and you are now stepping into a new dimension of faith, opening up the realm of truth. So these are beautiful, incredible principles, but they come into very practical application when you realize that every single day, we face these crazy things that erupt, don't we? I mean, crazy things. I said someday, Sunday morning. What was that one point I had? Sunday morning? I don't know. So many notes. But about the size of your enemy is proportionate to the size or how God sees your ability to overcome him or something like that. I think I might have just combined two of them. But it's, if God introduces a, hu if a, if a huge enemy is introduced in your life, something huge, that's God saying, look how much confidence I have in your ability to overcome that bad boy. Every opportunity. So if you're faced with a lot of this stuff, man, God's got a lot of confidence in you, girl. And he's saying, look, fix, you know, he's doing one of these to you. <laughs> fix your gaze on me. Don't, don't look over there. You know, and just see him being all sassy with you and just saying, that's it. This is about me and you, kid. We got this. Like you want to do to your teenage daughter, you know? You get in that. Oh, Jesus. Oh, I got two. We're at the point in our lives where God is saying, here's a whole new realm of who I am, and you're going to find out just how royal you really are. But you got to come into agreement. Step in. Step in. The one scripture, he was talking about the renewal of the mind and all this kind of stuff. But the one scripture that kind of came alive to me this week, and I didn't really study it, but I just want to leave you with it. It says, we are no longer slaves to sin. We are slaves to righteousness. And I thought, man, people don't like that word slave because it has such a negative connotation in history. And it still does, and it's true. But we're not talking about a worldly form of slavery. The enemy is, is that form of slavery. God's form of slavery is covenantal. And what he says is, listen, I've made you righteous. And you come in, you fix your gaze, you make those choices, and you come into agreement with me. You will no longer feel bound to those slavish ways of the enemy, those horrible things, those old patterns of thinking, that bitterness that kept rearing its other head, ugly head, the, all the stuff, you know, the addictions, the stuff that he just wants to wrap you up in like a mummy and watch you fall. He said, you're no longer bound to that. 
And every time you come in, you're going to find out that really, if you're slave to anything, you're slave to my righteousness, which means you're bound to my righteousness. You are wrapped in my righteousness. You are clothed in my righteousness. You are, as your DNA, righteous. So we're no longer slaves over here. So don't go back and say, you've been set free, and don't go back to the enemy and go, here. Ridiculous, right? Just absolutely ridiculous. You would never do it. But we do it every day. So we look at these situations. We look at every opportunity, every hit, every opportunity to walk sideways, every distraction is an opportunity to come into greater agreement with him. So remember those two things. Absolutely. I could just jump in real quick. I just want to read what, what she's saying. But, but earlier in worship and today before I came in, I'm going to just read that quote again. Prayer takes hold of the promise and conducts it to its marvelous ends, removes the obstacles, and makes a highway for the promise to reach its glorious fulfillment. And I'm just jumping out of my seat here because it, it's just, you know, when we pray, even if it's like, you know, something's going on and, and you're like, you know, you just <laughs> take a minute, you just speak in tongues or just, you, it's like you're creating a highway. You're, you're, you're connecting yourself to the promise and it's conducting things. You know what I'm saying? Like when you pray, you know that it's conducting things and it may take a month, it may take a year, whatever it takes, but it's like you're, that prayer is removing the obstacles and you're creating a highway through your prayers. I just had to jump in and reinforce that. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Right. Beautiful. Very true. You know, the amazing, the amazing thing, repentance is how you receive forgiveness. Where you come in and you say, God, Repentance isn't just, can you, I'm sorry for what I did. Repentance is, I want to turn this whole thing around. I want to be a totally different person. I want to be transformed. I can't do this anymore. That's repentance. It's like, God, take over. That doesn't mean you're not going to slip and fall and stumble, whatever. But it's that heart cry of, God, I can't do anything. I, you just, you've got to. And that's where his forgiveness comes. But don't let the enemy lie to you and pull you back in with his deception That's where you say, God, I receive your forgiveness. I forgive myself. And I'm clinging to you with everything that I have. That's agreement. That's coming into. That's like pulling those two sides of the same coin. That's the metal of the coin is that agreement that I will live in a posture of repentance so that I can receive your forgiveness. And that is causing my faith to soar in dimensions because I'm living in covenant. Covenantal living. This was another great quote, and I'm done. I am really am done. We cannot afford to think differently of ourselves than God does. Yeah. So tonight I leave you with that. God sees you as the one he paid it all for. You cannot afford to think differently of yourself than he thinks of you. He sees you as his daughter. He sees you as royalty, not a peasant. He sees you as his heir. You know, think about a billionaire that has an heir. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've picked this one as my heir. Don't blow it. No. <laughs> but it's, it, it's even bigger than that. God looks at you with all that he is. It's like, I've chosen you as my heir. And that's what he sees. You cannot afford in your life to think of yourself less than God sees you. Amen? Mm. Yes. Yeah, it really is. And it, it's not only dishonoring, but you're losing the supernatural dimensions of God when you do that. Does that make any sense? It's like when you lessen his work, his blood-purchased work of any kind, any way in your life, you're putting a kind of like a closed sealed door on the supernatural activities of God in your life so when I say when you're walking in covenant with God you're opening that door 
okay? You're opening that conduit. When you move, let your brain go this direction and you start walking and agreeing with the enemy and his lies and illusions, you're sealing that door. So, so many people find themselves over there and they've made so many unconscious agreements with the enemy because they've just f gone with the flow rather than seeing and discerning and walking in the word and in decisions, bringing them closer to the kingdom. We just go with the flow. And that's how he pulls you in. You know, it, he pulls you into, the, into that place. So many times I see things in my spirit and it's hard for me to put words to, but there's, there is that place that he pulls you into of numbness. You know, and you're just kind of like, you know, like, you know, teenagers today where that that's where cutting came from because they just want to feel something. You know, teens that are so lost and so broken, they have they've shut off their feelings out of defense and they start cutting themselves just to feel something. But that's the lies and the illusions of the enemy. And that's where he wants to take you to the place where you're just totally numb, that the world's ways, everything, you're just numb to it. You just fall prey to it. You just go that direction. But we have to stop that in his tracks and you keep your gaze fixed. With him at your table, keep your gaze fixed. Even when you feel like he's running right on your hind legs with you, just keep your gaze fixed. And in that moment, you are coming into greater agreement and covenantal relationship is opening up for you in a new dimension. But it's a daily opportunity. Let's not say it's a daily choice because that sounds so burdensome. It's a daily opportunity to find more and more of who he is, which in turn you find more and more of who you are. Now I am going to pray. <laughs> I could talk about this stuff all night except I got to go home and pack. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. We, we worship you, God. We come into this place tonight where we understand our ways. We understand where we've been, and we understand our tendencies to just get distracted and allow the enemy to play his game in our lives. But tonight, Lord, I think I could speak for all of us where we say, no more. We want to fix our gaze upon you, our Lord, our King, our groom, our groom. Fix our gaze on you, and we come into agreement with you tonight that we will not be deceived any longer. We will not walk in deception or fall victim to the enemy's illusions and lies in our life, but we choose to come into greater agreement with you and open up the conduit of covenantal relationship with you in a greater dimension, Lord. God, through it all, you are the revealer of truth, you know, something came to me tonight. It's something that Bishop Knox says all the time, that he reveals to heal. And I say that so much when I'm praying with people. God only reveals things in order to heal. So if something's happened in your life recently, maybe this week, maybe in the months, last few months where you're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. This is ridiculous. What's going on? God's revealed that thing so that he can turn it around and release his covenantal provision for that. He reveals, he likes everything in the light because he is the light. So anything left in darkness has no part of him. So we invite God, let's just do that, just invite God to be the revelation in our lives. I invite you, Lord, to reveal things. We don't want to live in illusion or darkness. We want to live in your truth. Even if it hurts for a season, we want to live in truth. God, I thank you that your supernatural grace and power is accessible and available and hovering over us at every moment. So we just literally lift our lives to you and say, God, just flow through me. Flow through me. May I be a conduit of your supernatural activity. May I be a conduit of your kingdom, a conduit of your grace, a conduit of your glory, a conduit of covenantal decrees and promises to be released, Lord, a conduit of truth. How many of you want that tonight? I just feel like we need to express our hunger to him tonight. I want to be a conduit of your truth, Lord. I don't want to live in illusions and lies and deception. I want to be a conduit of your truth, Lord. 
In the midst of it all, God, your goodness overwhelms us, Lord. Your beauty and your grace overwhelm us, Lord. If you're facing something in particular in your life that needs supernatural breakthrough, period, there's no other option, would you just stand right where you're at? If you need like a supernatural breakthrough, like it's, it's, it's got to be you or it's just not going to happen. Now, if there's somebody around you, can you lay hands on them with me? Because I'm not going to be able to do all this myself. So if there's somebody near you, just lay your hands on their shoulder or whatever. Or, yeah, or hold hands. That would be awesome as well. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Just start praying over them. Start praying over them. You don't even know, need to know what it is. Just start praying victory, authority, dominion, walking in kingdom power. Oh, we take authority over that thing in the name of Jesus. We take authority over that in the name of Jesus. Breakthrough. Breakthrough. Supernatural healings and deliverance and power and wisdom and grace and truth. 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 See on Tanda Rarabaki. See on Baba Bakashiri and Rabakasi TTI. Truth. Truth. Yes, Jesus. Dominion and power, strength. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Speak the word. 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 See on Baba Bakoshi, Narabako, TTT, and Arabasi. Yes, speak it. Speak it. Speak the word. Gonna fix my gaze, no holy place, and walk in your way. I'm gonna lift my gaze upon your face, no your way. Gonna 
fix my gaze on the holy place and walk in your ways. I'm gonna lift my gaze upon your face and Seek, Lord. 